Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host, Michael. On a Wednesday, I want to talk about a video that Abbot Trifon just recently did. He's an Eastern Orthodox abbot. It's called Leave Rome and Come Home. I have a link to it there in the show notes. I want to review it. It's only eight minutes long, very, very short. Um, yeah, it's really an incredible video, as we're going to see here in a moment. It really doesn't contain any kind of theological argumentation against Catholicism, save for maybe one um, minimal attempt at engaging Catholicism doctrinally. It's mostly mudslinging, low blows, um, Trifon effectively capitalizing and cashing in on scandals in Catholicism while ignoring uh, scandals within Orthodoxy and somehow using that as a standard to put forward the very worn out, tired, apologetic argument that Eastern Orthodox online are still putting forward, which I have no idea why they're still putting it forward, but the claim that the Orthodox Church has never changed, it's been the same from day one, come to the Orthodox Church where nothing has ever changed. And, and you think, oh, that's being overly simplistic. He doesn't actually say that. Actually, he does. Actually, he does. Which is why it's it's like, yeah, that, that one's burnt out. Like, it, it reminds me of when some Catholic apologists were doing this, right? Back in the 90s. Ah, the Catholic Church has never changed. Come home to Rome. It's never changed. Stop. Just stop. Now, sure, there's, there's a grain of truth. Have we preserved the substance of the faith, the deposit of faith? That hasn't changed. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously, there's all kinds of changes in the Catholic Church, and they're not necessarily bad. Change isn't necessarily bad. Depends on what kind of change we're talking about. Well, the kinds of changes that St. Vincent of Lorenz would describe are acceptable. Yes, those are good. The ones that he would condemn as bad, yes, those are bad. Um, anyways, it's just curious to see Orthodox actually still putting this forward as if People are still buying it. I, I guess maybe there are some Protestants out there who don't really know church history and are buying it whenever they see somebody say, yeah, come to Orthodoxy where the church has never changed. And look at Rome, how much it's changed its liturgy. And so come home to Orthodoxy and not to Rome because we're the church of the first century. We're ancient. We haven't changed anything. That might work with a Protestant who knows nothing about church history, but for people who know a little bit more than that or a step up from that, this isn't going to work. You're going to actually have to start doing some heavy lifting and addressing Catholic arguments, which we're not going to get from Abbot Trifon. It's very, unfortunately, it's that anti-intellectual side that you find among uh, Orthodox, and not that all Orthodox are anti-intellectual, historically or even presently. There are some that historically and even presently are not anti-intellectual. But then you'll find the kind that are this way. So I want to review it. He focuses, as you can imagine, mostly on the liturgy. I want to share my screen. And I'm not getting into Trifon's issues here with ancient faith ministries and what all happened there and what's going on with the montanica conference and stuff like that i'm not getting into all that you can go read about it at your own leisure i have a link to this article there in the show notes go and read it you can also read trifon's response to ancient faith uh radio and ancient faith ministries and why everything went down the way that it did i'm not that that's not the purpose of this i know there's people are going to ask me hey well will you comment on it just just go and read it. You know, that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's actually look at the video itself. Again, this is leave Rome and come home. No attempt to poach converts there. All right, let's uh, let's watch it together. Let me make sure to enable audio, though. Uh, let's see here. All right, let's see what he has in store for us. Let's find out why we Catholics need to leave Rome, come home to eastern orthodoxy even though we already have orthodoxy within communion with rome it's called eastern catholicism so why would i leave eastern catholicism and lose communion with the pope by by as an eastern catholic leaving for eastern orthodoxy i lose something i don't gain anything 
everything that Eastern Orthodoxy has to offer me, I already have in Eastern Catholicism. Everything. I already have it. I also have something extra with Rome, and that is communion with the papacy that is essential, as we're going to see towards the end. I'm going to show why Abbot Trifon needs to listen to councils and be reconciled to Rome. He says, leave Rome and come home. I'm going to say, listen to your councils and be reconciled to Rome. You'll see why here in a little bit. But let's first watch his video. I've had a number of individuals who have been visiting the monastery who are Roman Catholic and, and are having second thoughts about whether they want to continue in that church. And you know what? With as many voices as there are in Catholicism who are constantly mudslinging against Pope Francis and saying that the church is now basically taken over by the Antichrist and Catholic voices out there who are constantly criticizing the Pope in the magisterium and councils, I can imagine why some people are saying, yeah. Maybe I need to look into some other things. And I can also imagine why there's a lot of Orthodox who say, yeah, I'm not so sure about coming to Rome. Listen to you guys. I know an Orthodox priest who has serious difficulty with considering Catholicism. Why? Because he listens to radical traditionalist Catholics talk about the Pope all the time. No wonder. Okay, let's continue. Uh, one person told me that it was hard to believe that they were receiving the body and blood of Christ when they went to Mass, given the fact that everything moved so quickly and the service had been so streamlined and short that shortened that they felt like all the mystery of the Mass had disappeared and that it was more like a... a wow. Wow, so that makes them doubt the real presence of Christ because it's been streamlined and shortened. Wow, um, I guess they don't realize how much the liturgies in Eastern Orthodoxy have been streamlined and shortened. Does that mean somehow they lack the real presence? No, not at all. Is there a legitimate critique where we could say maybe it shouldn't be shortened so much in the Roman liturgy? Maybe things should be a little bit more expanded? Sure. But should that make one doubt sacramental validity? Sounds like Donatism. It sounds like there's an implicit embracing of the heresy of Donatism here. Not exactly sure how that impacts the validity of the sacrament, but okay. Oh, a communal time together, everybody standing around singing hymns that were, you know, recently composed and happy, happy hymns and... um. Okay, hymns that were recently composed. You know, the hymns that exist in Eastern Orthodox liturgies were at one point recently composed. So this is a really odd argument for him to repeat here. Not exactly sure why, since it can't really consistently be upheld for the Orthodox position. There's also hymns in Eastern Orthodoxy that are recently composed. So I don't see how that's necessarily a critique of the Roman liturgy. Um, also a communal meal, emphasis on a communal meal. That, that's interesting, given the fact that the original context of the Eucharist was in a communal meal. It's called the Agape Feast. The original context of the Eucharistic sacrifice was in the context of a communal meal. Hence why in the New Testament, it's referred to as the Lord's table, because there is a meal aspect there. Now, obviously, some people can take that too far and divorce it from the sacrificial aspect um, and treat it like it's just a common meal and it's not the real presence of Christ. Obviously, some people can go too far with it. But what I have noticed is with some Catholics and some Eastern Orthodox, they have gone too far in the opposite direction in reacting against Protestants who emphasize the communal meal aspect because it is biblical and it is true. They overreact and want to emphasize the Eucharistic sacrifice to the exclusion of any meal aspect. And I just find that to be guilty of the exact same thing that the Protestants are guilty of. Listening to a priest give a homily that on really nothing except, oh, let's be happy, let's commune together, but not having all right, so bad homilies are ca causing these people to d doubt the validity. That's interesting. I've heard some Eastern Orthodox homilies that have taught heresy. I mean, there was one homily where an Eastern Orthodox priest 
did an entire homily about how you do not need to repent of your sins in order to be forgiven by God. Literally, that was the message. And I didn't misunderstand them. That was the entire message, the whole thing over and over. You do not need repentance in order to be forgiven by God. You don't have to repent of your sins to be forgiven by God over and over and over and over. And he misunderstood some scriptures and completely ignored sacrament of confession, completely ignored all kinds of scriptures that talk about repenting and the necessity of repentance in order to receive God's forgiveness. You'll, you'll find heresy being preached from some Eastern Orthodox pulpits. That doesn't mean that Eastern Orthodoxy is false. It doesn't mean that it's not what it claims to be just because you have a bad homily. It just means that sometimes you have priests who are deficient. That exists in Eastern Orthodoxy, just as it does in Catholicism. So to even bring this up as an antidote or an anecdote, um, somehow to prove why people are coming to Orthodoxy, well, be, be consistent. What happens when people find this kind of stuff in Orthodoxy? What are you going to tell them then? You're going to say, oh, no, well, that, that priest is just wrong. You know, sometimes you have people who teach heresy. That doesn't mean we're not the true church. Oh, but wait. That's okay for you to use, but you won't use it for the Catholics? Why won't you advise that to your Catholic inquirers when they come to you with these kind of grievances that you know are low blows and you know you're not being consistent? Tell them, hey, that's not a good reason to come to Eastern Orthodoxy. That's not a good reason to question Catholicism. Because again, you don't believe it's a good reason to question Orthodoxy. Be fair here. Use equal measures. It's an abomination, according to Scripture in the book of Proverbs, to use unequal weights. Oh, well, this is a defeater for you guys, but it's not a defeater for us when it happens to us. I mean, the depth that the Roman Catholic Church had at one time. So this person was concerned about the liturgy's lack of depth that the church at one point had. Um of course, I think that some people could criticize some aspects of orthodoxy in the same way. But I would also say that, um, sure, could some things be improved in the Roman Rite? A absolutely. But you also realize in the preconciliar period, there were priests who were rushing through the Latin liturgy um, in a way that, you know, maybe it took maybe 20 minutes to do the liturgy, fumbling over the Latin, which many people didn't even understand, and rushing through the service just to kind of get, get it over with. So I think that one is kind of overly idealizing things in the pre-conciliar period and contrasting it with grievances that they have in the post-conciliar period. One of the beautiful things about being Orthodox that I discovered early on as a convert was that the Orthodox Church is the only Christian faith that can claim to be virtually unchanged from the early first centuries of the church see th this is what i'm saying is tired outdated stop it when catholics use this kind of argument i say look i know what you're trying to say and yeah what you're trying to say is the faith has been preserved intact substantially yes you're correct but just stop it Again, when they're trying to communicate the church essentially in its structure has still been preserved, of course, but people aren't going to understand it that way. They're going to understand Catholicism to mean that this is exactly how it's always been for 2000 years. So when Catholics do that, I, I have to critique them. And so when I see Orthodox do it, I, I have to critique them as well. This is really lowbrow apologetics it's time to move past it you actually have way stronger arguments for the orthodox position than to resort to this kind of stuff again it works for protestant inquirers who really may not know anything about church history to know any better but it's not going to work for anyone who's a step up from that uh but maybe that's all they need you know maybe maybe that's really all trifon needs at the end of the day is to reach that group of people um, or, or maybe some Catholics who are disgruntled and tired of seeing liturgical abuses. And so they may also may not know very much about church history and they kind of feel, well, this is somehow authentic. This is somehow unchanged. This is somehow the, uh, the same liturgy that they had 2000 years ago. So I'm going to go to orthodoxy now. Is it really the case? That, you know, virtually unchanged in 2000 years. This is a joke. Look, I love 
orthodoxy. Again, I'm Byzantine Catholic. I love the orthodox tradition. I have the orthodox tradition in communion with Rome. I have it and I defend it, but I will defend it properly and say, yes, there have been some changes. They have, there aren't substantial changes to the faith. No, but there are plenty of accidental changes. And so any changes that you can point to with Rome are going to be also accidental in nature. And whatever significance that you attribute to them, they're still accidental. They're not substantial. Well, you also have the same thing in Eastern Orthodoxy. In fact, I, I could say, I could argue that some Orthodox, however, are deviating in substantial areas. But let me, let me give you just a, a, a few examples. Some of these are accidental and some of them might end up being substantial. Uh, for the Orthodox who had maintained them. Uh, but the penitential for, uh, system, for instance, in the early church, we have all departed from the penitential system of the early church. All of us, everybody, every single Christian, nobody holds to the penitential system of the early church. It was so strict that in some cases, you were not allowed to re-enter into communion after a mortal sin. It was that strict. And in some cases, they said, okay, out of concession, we'll grant you confession one time in your life for a mortal sin. But after that, we will no longer grant you confession. That's it. And in some cases, they would say, okay, well, if you sin again mortally after your one confession, you know, post-baptism, you sin mortally, you get one confession. Um, and then if you sin again mortally after that, at best, we'll let you back into communion on your deathbed. At best. Otherwise, we're turning you over to the mercy of God, but you're no longer able to rece be received back into communion. It was incredibly rigorous in some parts and in some instances. There, there was divergence here and there, but it was incredibly rigorous. In other cases, they would say, okay, yeah, we'll give you even more uh, opportunities to receive confession, even after mortal sin, after your first confession. But you might have to wait 20 or 30 years before you can be received back into the church. You might have to do penance in front of the doors of the church for 20, 30 years. We'll let you back in in 20 years, though. <laughs> so... <laughs> We have all departed from the penitential practices of the early church, which, by the way, whenever they did confession was public. It wasn't private in nature. It was generally public. Um, so the standard has been significantly relaxed, both in Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. The fasting standards, everything has been relaxed. Um, compared to the standards that you find in many parts of the early church. In Eastern Orthodoxy, the bishop generally is no longer the one who primarily chrismates people or infants. It's usually assigned to priests, and there are historical reasons why that happened, and they're perfectly fine, and I think that they can be defended as legitimate. I don't have a problem with them. But what I'm saying is that is a change from an apostolic practice. Apostolic practice was the bishop was the one who would generally administer confirmation, not a priest. But that has been delegated to a priest in um, most instances in Eastern Orthodoxy. Again, which is fine, but just be uh, just be upfront and admit this is a departure from an apostolic practice. It's a legitimate one. It's one that the church is able to do, but it is a departure. Stop it with this nonsense about how the church is just virtually unchanged. Stop. Just stop it. Icon veneration. Stop it. He wants to talk about how, you know, if a Christian from the early church walked into our church uh, today in Eastern Orthodoxy, they would be right at home. Not exactly. Not exactly. Now, we just recently had a four hour lecture from Swan Sona defending icon veneration. Certainly go and watch it. And he shows some interesting precedents in Judaism. And he addresses some instances in the early church that have sometimes been used against icon veneration, but frankly, uh, can't be used against icon veneration. But that being said, has there been a significant uh, change in emphasis when it comes to icon veneration and the use of images? Of course there has been. Of course there's been some development here. Obviously. Is it a substantial change? No. But it's a significant accidental development in emphasis. So, has it just always just been untouched, unchanged? 
maybe not necessarily in substance. Um, you know, maybe maybe it hasn't changed in substance. But we would argue the same in in even uh, Catholicism. We would say that the substance of the faith has been preserved. So again, if you can afford yourself accidental changes, why can't you do that for Catholics as well? Another one is the essence and energies distinction in theology, Eastern Orthodox theology. There's certainly been some development there, as Orthodox scholars will admit. They'll they'll admit icon veneration is a development. Orthodox scholars will admit essence and energies distinction is a development. But is it a substantial change? No, but it's a significant accidental development. It's the exact same thing that we say in Catholicism for some of the things that he's pointing out here. Divorce and remarriage is allowed in Eastern Orthodoxy. There's going to be plenty who would argue that is a change. And there's some who would argue that's a substantial change to the deposit of faith in uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy. Some some Catholics will argue that that they have departed from the faith and from the teachings of Jesus Himself. Now others will come to their defense and defend it in one way or another. I understand that, but there's a major debate taking place there that you really have to defend yourself from. Whenever you start to talk about how ah, it's virtually unchanged, really? Okay, well, let's talk about the issue of divorce and remarriage. Let's talk about the issue of contraception and Eastern Orthodoxy. Let's talk about those things. Uh, not only that, I mean, but Eastern Orthodox have abandoned the ecclesiology of Jesus. They have. It's there in their tradition. That's why I say, well, we still have the same faith. You're just not necessarily following it right now. But you still have it there in your sources. You're just not following it. You're just not following your councils. You're just not following your scripture in this area. They have a major deficiency in their ecclesiology, as we'll see here in a moment. Same with the Filioque for those Eastern Orthodox who have departed from the theology of the Filioque. Yes, it is emphasized and understood a little bit differently in the East. That's fine. But the substance of it is still should be the same, East and West. But many Orthodox have departed from the substance of the understanding of the procession of the Holy Spirit. They've departed from that, which is part of the deposit of faith because it is in sacred scripture. Again, it's in their sources, so it's it's still there. They're just not necessarily being faithful to it. So we talk about, you know, it's virtually unchanged. It's going to be a lot harder to defend whenever you start to have to address questions like these. How exactly are you being consistent here? Now, let's continue. He, he moves on a little bit more um, into the question of the liturgy. The liturgy that we, perf that we have in every Sunday or in every holy day or feast day or saints day is an ancient liturgy that is based on the liturgy of St. James of Jerusalem, who was the cousin of Jesus. And when there is um, a shred of truth to it. First of all, um, talking about the liturgy of St. James, actually going back to St. James cannot be historically defended. I haven't seen any actual evidence for that. Um, but could you argue that the divine, the divine liturgy of John Chrysostom, which is the liturgy that I prefer uh, as a Byzantine Catholic, and the one that he's talking about that he uses, uh, that liturgy, can you argue, comes from the liturgy of St. James to a degree, to a degree, as, as maybe it has its roots there. But compare the liturgy of St. James side by side with the liturgy of Chrysostom, and you'll notice the liturgy of Chrysostom is a lot shorter. It's a lot more truncated. Um, whereas the liturgy of St. James is a lot longer. Um, now, you you can then point to those accidental changes and as significant as those are they're not substantial in nature i grant that the essence of the liturgy is still there the essence of the faith is still there absolutely well but can't we say the exact same thing about the roman rite and its reforms to its liturgy the essence is still there even if it's shorter in some ways yes you can still say the exact same thing for the roman rite but it's okay whenever they have a shorter liturgy because, again, the substance is still preserved. Okay, well, why can't you apply that to Latin Rite Catholics who, yes, 
have shortened their liturgy in the post-conciliar period, but there's nothing new. I mean, Gregory the Great shortened the anaphora. Gregory the Great, the, the liturgy has certainly been shortened in the West over a long period of time, just as it has in Eastern Orthodoxy. If it's okay for you, why is it not okay for the Latin Rite Catholics? It's just a bad argument. One of the apostles. <clears throat> This is really a beautiful thing. The, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which is the liturgy that most Orthodox churches use today, is based on the liturgy of St. James. It's just a little embellishment, and that's it. No. No. I think Abbot Trifon needs to really look a little bit more into his own liturgy here. It's significantly shorter. Um, and also, again... First of all, the liturgy of St. James is 4th century. That's the earliest attestation that we have to it. It's certainly not what was taking place in the 1st century. Because in the 1st century, they were doing what? They were celebrating the liturgy in the context of a communal meal, the agape feast, which nobody is doing. Nobody today does that. I don't know any Catholics, Protestants, or Orthodox who have an agape feast during the Eucharistic liturgy. I mean, it's just it's not done by anybody. Everybody has departed from that fact. You start to get these liturgies later on, 4th century and so on. Liturgy, liturgy of St. James is 4th century. You could say it's a it's an ancestor, if you will, of the liturgy of Chrysostom, which develops well into the 14th century. The 14th century. Let, let me read something to you here. Let, let, me, let me give you um, a uh, quote here from Wybrew on the Orthodox liturgy. Anglican scholar who loves the Byzantine liturgy and uh, speaks about it historically. He says, by the 14th century, the Orthodox liturgy had reached the full term of its development. A process of consolidation was underway. Consolidation. Local variations in practice continue to exist in the Orthodox world. Local variations. Yes, because not everybody celebrated the Byzantine liturgy, by the way. And then those who had the Byzantine liturgy, there were all kinds of variations. But I'll add that there were plenty of in, in, instances where the Byzantine liturgy was forced on Christians. They, there were plenty of Christians who had other versions of the liturgy. They had their own liturgies. And they were supplanted by the Byzantine liturgy. There was a great deal of... Um, you know, the Byzantine Empire wanted a great deal of uniformity and supplanted a lot of liturgies. And that's why you see uniformity today in Eastern Orthodoxy, at least in part. Uh, but still at this time, there were still local variations in practice that continued to exist even within the Byzantine liturgy in the Orthodox world. But the widespread influence of the diataxis of Philotheos helped to establish a basic uniformity in the celebration of the liturgy in all the churches of the Byzantine Commonwealth. So we're talking about a uniformity that's really 14th century, not 1st century, not virtually unchanged. Philotheos was a monk of Mount Athos who became Patriarch of Constantinople in 1354. Two rival typica or set rules for celebrating the services of the church were in use in the city. The traditional typicon of the great church was that which originated in the 9th century in the monastery of St. John of uh, Studius. By the 12th century, the typicon of the monastery of St. Sabas near Jerusalem was gradually gaining ground, not least because it gave more detailed instructions for the celebration of the services, and so on and so on and so on. The point is, there's all kinds of developments that took place in the Byzantine liturgy. Yes, the Byzantine liturgy is a very, very short version compared to some older liturgies that were much longer. Okay, if you can grant that for the Eastern Orthodox liturgies, specifically the liturgy of Chrysostom, then why can't you grant that to Latin Rite Catholics who have shortened their liturgy as well, but kept the substance of the faith and kept the substance of the sacrament and the substance of the liturgy intact? You see, it's okay for them, but it's not okay for Latin Rite Catholics. It's using unequal weights. This is, again, what is condemned in Scripture, using unequal measures. But it wasn't a dumbing down. The Protestant world dumbed down big time. 
And in fact, the whole idea of having a freestanding altar in the Roman Catholic Church came from the Presbyterians. They were the ones that had a communion table in the... God bless him. Um, there's been a variety in the Roman right here, freestanding free altars versus up against the wall. And Eastern Orthodox have freestanding altars, so why is he complaining about where it came from? But he's saying, well, it came from Presbyterians. Did it really... Or have you just been listening to radical traditionalists who told you that? But listen to this part. Minister would stand behind the communion table and uh, with the grape juice and the bread. And the day that Vatican II decided that was the route they were going to go was really the beginning of, of, of the final ruination of the Roman Catholic Church from its, its roots. Um. Pure ignorance, ignorance on fire here, on full display for you. Um, Abbot Trifon has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. It is clear he has never read Sacra Sanctum Concilium or the Second Vatican Council, but he repeats this nonsensical um, and untrue claim about the Catholic Church that somehow Vatican II did this. Really? Really? Where? Where, where is that in Sacra Sanctum Concilium? Explain that to me. I'd love to see. And it's like he's complaining about the altar being a communal meal and a table. R really? Abbot Trifon? You know very well that your altar is called the Holy Table in Eastern Orthodoxy, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. I'm just saying be consistent. Look at this. Altar. The altar is often referred to as the sanctuary. An altar table is located at the center of the altar. As one enters through the royal door, doors um, in the iconostasis, the table is also referred to as a holy table in Eastern Orthodoxy and Eastern Catholicism, I, which, again, I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have an issue saying the Eucharist is both a Eucharistic sacrifice and a meal. I don't have a problem saying that it is both an altar and a table. I don't have an issue with that because they're both true. They're both biblical. I'm not going to be reactionary against the Protestants. I'm going to accept both. And I'm also not going to be reactionary against others. I'm just going to say it's a both hand. But he seems very upset here that there's now a recognition of it being a table. Well, wait, you have that recognition as well. Are you trying to say that you think that it is being overemphasized? Is that what you're trying to say? Then say that. But that's not what we're getting from this. What we're getting from him is repeating misinformation about Vatican II and then repeating the idea that somehow Catholics no longer believe it's a Eucharistic sacrifice, even though it's clearly there in the Novus Ordo. It's clearly there as a sacrifice, not just a meal. When you have a, the priest standing behind a table... I remember even one time walking into a, a small uh, ch uh, student chapel in Berkeley, California, and uh, just as the mass was in process of going, and the minister, the priest, lifted up a clear glass chalice, more like a wine glass, without saying the words, and he lifted up a loaf of French bread, and as he lifted the loaf up, he broke it in two, and particles of that French bread went everywhere on the on the altar and on the floor, and he didn't seem to care. And, and then he broke it up, and everybody went forward and put their hand out, and he gave them a piece of this bread, this French bread. It was it it, it was cringeworthy, frankly. Okay. Right. I agree. But what does that have to do with come come home to orthodoxy and leave Rome? That has nothing to do with that. It's an abuse. It's clearly condemned in the Catholic Church. That's outrageously condemned by the Catholic Church explicitly. You would need the words of consecration, and there are very strict rubrics for how the liturgy is to be done in the Novus Ordo. So... That's a deviation. That's an abuse. 
Well, what if I point to abuses in Eastern Orthodoxy, liturgical abuses in Eastern Orthodoxy? Oh, no, 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 no. That doesn't disprove us. We're still the Orthodox Church, unchanged. Oh, oh, it's okay for you guys? No, 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 it's not okay. But it doesn't change ultimately the faith. And that's just a deviation from the faith. But we're still the true church. But hold on, wait. But you're implying that this is somehow a knock on Catholicism as a whole and a reason why you need to leave Rome and join Eastern Orthodoxy. But wait, it's okay to employ that argument against Catholics, but it's not okay to employ the same argument against Eastern Orthodoxy. So if we start pointing to liturgical abuses, that somehow you're, you're still good, but for us, it's a death blow. You, I've, I know I've showed this video before because it's come up before, but there are plenty of abuses in Eastern Orthodoxy. That doesn't disprove Eastern Orthodoxy, though. So I don't use that argument against Orthodox. I don't say, well, because you have these elements of abuse or you have these instances of heresy, I don't say, well, that somehow disproves Catholicism. Because I also think that it doesn't, I'm sorry, I don't think it disproves Orthodoxy in the same way that I don't believe it disproves Catholicism. Let, let's look at a few of these, though. Just to prove the point. Oh, my God. And don't say, oh, well, this is just taking place outside of divine liturgy, because first of all, how, how do you know that? But second of all, OK, I could say the same thing with some of these other abuses. Well, they're taking place outside of the mass. And, uh, and I can point you to abuses that are taking place in the divine liturgy and orthodoxy as well. So just come on, be consistent is all I'm saying. And by the way, I'm not necessarily saying everything that I see here is a liturgical abuse, but the person who posted the video feels that all this is a liturgical abuse. На самом деле мы немножечко живем, живем в некоторые иллюзии о том, что якобы Бога нельзя там проставлять в инструментах, но сама традиция библейская говорит нам совершенно об обратном. Oh, I think this is where the Patriarch of Moscow says that uh, Muslims worship the same God as Christians. Um, so anytime an Orthodox tries to say, well, you know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says it. Well, hold, hold on. Hold on. Are you in communion with this guy? Всего сердца молитесь, просите у Господа помощи. Я знаю, что здесь и по христиане, и мусульмане. Каждый обращается к одному и тому же Богу, Творцу. И вот... В ответ на это мы получаем реальную Божью помощь. Разделили долгожданную радость мусульман. So I have a whole video re reviewing this thing, and um, let me show you some other liturgical abuses here. The baptism of a baby turned very violent at a church in Russia over the weekend. We want to warn you that the video may be disturbing to watch. So here it is. Take a look at this. You can see the one-year-old boy crying. You can hear him while Father Foyty starts to immerse him in a baptismal font. When the boy does not cooperate, the father uses force to continue the ritual. You can also see him fend off from the boy's mother who was trying to get her son back. Well, the father said the mother was overreacting. 
But the following day, the Russian Orthodox Church released a statement. It says Father Foyty has now been banned from performing baptism for a year. Only for a year. All right. Well, I guess after a year, uh, you need to keep your children safe. I don't Golly. Oh, stop. Please stop it. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, wouldn't you say some of this is an abuse? Probably. Probably. Okay. Does that somehow disprove Eastern Orthodoxy because you have some wild baptisms going on? Because you have some weird things taking place in the sanctuary? No, that doesn't disprove Eastern Orthodoxy. And put, by the way, there's plenty more of all kinds of things. That doesn't disprove Eastern Orthodoxy. It just means it's a deviation. It's a departure from the way things are to be done. Or if heresy is being preached from the pulpit, that doesn't disprove Eastern Orthodoxy. It just means that it's a deviation from the faith by that local minister. But you afford yourself that distinction, but you won't do that for Catholics. Because it's being implied here in the context of a video about leave Rome and come home to Eastern Orthodoxy because these things are taking place, because I know you're dissatisfied with these things, so let me capitalize on them. I know you're dissatisfied for liturgical abuses, so let me try to entice you into Eastern Orthodoxy by telling you, oh, this doesn't ever happen here. But when you find out, well, there's problems in Eastern Orthodoxy that are of the same nature. Oh, no, 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 no. That doesn't disprove Eastern Orthodoxy. But I would wager that most of the students that received the, that bread, that French bread at that mass, are no longer practicing Roman Catholics. Because what is there? I remember when I was in graduate school, I had a couple of friends who both confided in me that they had been Roman Catholics, but that the day that everything was forcibly changed in the Mass was the day they felt that their church had been taken from them. Forcibly changed the Mass. First of all, the bishops assented to this, right? So forcibly changing the Mass. I guess he's saying the laity were forced. Really, Father? You really want to go there? Given the fact that Byzantium forced all kinds of liturgies and uniformity? on Christians, there's a reason why you have so much uniformity in Eastern Orthodoxy and you don't have a bunch of local churches. Why is that? Oh, because the Byzantine Empire forced the Byzantine liturgy on a bunch of people and supplanted their liturgies. Which, by the way, again, I love the Byzantine liturgy. I prefer that above any other liturgy. But I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, it was forced on some people. Yes, their local churches were being supplanted. If this is somehow a deal breaker for Catholics, you need to also say it's a deal breaker for Eastern Orthodoxy. I mean, why bother? So they left. There, there are so many uh, teachings of the church. The Filioque is a good example. Uh, there's evidence now that Roman Catholics are admitting that that the uh, that the filioque clause was fabricated uh, because there was a pope that said I'm the pope and I can change what I want, and so having the that was his only attempt at a theological argument. By the way, everything else is just appealing to. Uh, people's negative reaction against liturgical abuses. Which, again, people can do this exact same thing. They, they can appeal to all kinds of weaknesses in Eastern Orthodoxy and try to poach converts through that um, by appealing to what people you know are dissatisfied with in Eastern Orthodoxy. That, that can also be done against Orthodox. But you don't like it whenever that's done with the Orthodox. Okay, well, don't do that to Catholics. 
But this is just ridiculous. Because a pope is saying, I can do whatever I want. That's how we ended up with the filioque. Really? So you literally don't know the very basics about how the filioque creed ended up finding its way into the Western creeds. The Western creed. You, you really don't know. You haven't even studied the very basics. But let me use your own scholar against you here. This is from Dr. Edward Sachensky, former Catholic turned Eastern Orthodox. In his uh, book here on the uh, Filioque, A History of the Doctrinal Controversy, page 65, not only does he mention plenty of uh, saints that are saints in Eastern Orthodoxy who held to the Filioque, but most importantly, he notices he notes this, even if one discounts some of those passages that modern scholarship has shown to be interpolated or spurious, the passages that follow clearly demonstrate. So he's about to present a whole bunch of passages that are authentic, that affirm the filioque and are by saints in Eastern Orthodoxy. But he says they clearly demonstrate that by the late sixth century, the filioque achieved a level of acceptance in the West bordering on unanimity unanimity your saints father your saints in the west that you consider to be orthodox saints were bordering on unanimity on the filioque and that had nothing to do with a pope this is absurd this is just ignorance on fire it's dishonest frankly i don't know if his intentions are dishonest but the argument is certainly dishonest. Wherever he got this from, it's misinformation. It's not true. It is not the case that somehow the filioque found its way because there's a pope who arbitrarily said, I can do whatever I want. Really? Back up your claim and then explain all of this other evidence indicating otherwise. I don't think he can do that because I don't think he's really looked into the issues. But for some reason, he decided to pull out this low blow and this cheap shot. And I, and I don't know why. The Holy Spirit emanate from the Father and the Son was added. And yet, uh, that really reduced the centrality and the importance of the Holy Spirit. Within Orthodoxy, the, the Son and the Holy Spirit emanate from the Father, who together are worshipped and glorified in, as tr in Trinity. Yeah, we don't deny that. We affirm that. It's in the same creed that you recite that we also recite. That's not in dispute here. That's not even where the dispute with the filioque is. And this is unchanged from the first century. Why would we want to change that? Nobody is asking you to change that. What are you talking about? This is a basic misunderstanding of the filioque. Nobody's asking you to change that. That has nothing to do with the filioque. And that's affirmed by Latin Rite Catholics. What's he talking about? This is such an elementary misunderstanding of the filioque that I have to wonder, what, what, how did this happen? How does one go from being a Lutheran Protestant to an Orthodox abbot and not know the very basics on what the filioque is? and how it found its way into the Western creed. I, I'm shocked. Uh, there were so many things I could go on and on and on. But the one thing I have noticed is the number of Roman Catholics, including priests, who are walking away. And okay, and I can point you to Orthodox priests who are walking away, Orthodox bishops who are walking away and conforming to Rome. What, what does that mean? Does that somehow mean Eastern Orthodoxy is not true? They'll say, no, no, they just never understood. Okay, well, can't Catholics say that? Well, they just never understood why they needed to be Catholic. And with reasons like these, by the way, yeah, they didn't understand why they needed to be Catholic. If you feel that you need to leave over liturgical abuses, you don't know why you needed to be Catholic to begin with. And to, the reason why you would want to be Catholic in spite of liturgical abuses is because this is the church that Christ established. He established that you would need to be in communion with Peter's successor in the Bishop of Rome. And that is essential for being in communion with the fullness of his church. And as we're going to see here a moment, 
the Orthodox have actually accepted that in their own councils. So they're in rebellion against their own councils when they are not in conformity and not in union with the Roman pontiff, as we'll see again here in a moment. And coming to Orthodoxy. I even know a bishop who had been a Roman Catholic priest and he finally had had enough of all the change and all the dumbing down of the Mass. And he walked away and embraced Orthodoxy. And now he's an Orthodox bishop. And there are plenty of Orthodox priests who get tired of all kinds of shenanigans going on in Orthodoxy. And guess what? They, they leave and go other places as well. Some go to Catholicism. Some go to true Orthodoxy, which are these schismatic groups that are broken away from canonical orthodoxy and they're not part of the eastern orthodox churches they're broken away from them and they claim to be the true orthodox there's all kinds of people who are dissatisfied with things in orthodoxy and leave that doesn't somehow disprove eastern orthodoxy but why use this then as an antidote or anecdote i should say why use this as a story to somehow prove why you need to leave Catholicism if you wouldn't use similar stories to say why you need to leave Eastern Orthodoxy. It's because one is being unfair. It's because one is not honestly attempting to be fair here and use equal weights. So, you know, this, this, and this in no way is meant to denigrate my many, many Roman Catholic friends who might. Even though it does. But, okay, it wasn't meant to. That doesn't really change anything because at the end of the day, his intentions don't change how atrocious this was. I love, and I know that in our heart of hearts that we all share this apostolic faith. If we all share the apostolic faith, then what's, what's the issue? Why point to all these other things as if we don't have the apostolic faith? But we in the Orthodox Church, and only in the Orthodox Church, do we own the complete, unadulterated teachings of the early church. You see how he had to explain that? They have the complete teachings. They have the fullness of the faith. Guess where he's getting that kind of language from? That articulation of Orthodoxy? Guess where the Orthodox are getting that articulation from? Catholics. It's Orthodox who get this kind of terminology and way of explaining itself. They get it from Catholicism. So you're now having to borrow from Catholics and the way Catholics describe their own communion. You're having to borrow from them to then describe your own communion. Doesn't that bother you just a little bit? We are the church the church militant here on earth that is joined together in the divine liturgy with the church triumphant in heaven. More terminology that is very common in the West. And the faith that we believe and the, and the doctrines that we teach and the services that we have in our temples are the same. If the They're the same. They're the same, y'all. Ignore all this other stuff. To the contrary, they're the same. The early Christians walked into an Orthodox church today, they would know where they were. If these same people walked into a Protestant church or a mega church, they would have no idea that it was even Christian. So this isn't a statement of bragging about Orthodoxy because in, in all joy the lord brought me into the church as a former protestant as a por former lutheran i think he brought that anti-catholicism with him that you tend to find in protestantism which i've noted noticed with a lot of protestant converts to orthodoxy who who did not come from catholicism they tend to bring with them a lot of anti-intellectual and anti-catholic argumentation against the catholic church And, and, and so I am grateful to God for that. And now I just simply want to share the apostolic faith with those around me. Come home.
All right. So uh, his his admonition for us is come home, leave Rome, come home again. My uh, response to Abbot Trifon would be to respectfully say, listen to your own counsels and reconcile the Rome. Listen to your own counsels. I'm not asking you to believe anything you don't already in theory claim to believe. You might not explicitly believe it, but it's right there in your own tradition. But you're not embracing it. Let's look at it. This is from uh, the letter of Agatha to the emperor, read at the Six Ecumenical Council and received by the council fathers. They approved of it, and they even cite the Petrine Foundation for it. So they don't have a problem with the theology here. They agree with it. Well, listen what to, to what the Pope says to the emperor that's read out loud at the council that the council fathers in the East received. This is your own council. You can't dodge it. You can't say, oh, well, you know, that's not a count. This is an ecumenical council. For this is the rule of the true faith, which is the spiritual mother of your most tranquil empire. Spiritual mother. How does... Agatha used that term in context here. Agatha refers to the Church of Rome as the spiritual mother, but it's going to be even more clear in the context here. Follow what we're saying, because it's not spiritual mother is referring to all of the churches. No, 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 no. He's going to explain to you in context what he means. Pay attention. Which is the spiritual mother of your most tranquil empire. The apostolic church of Christ has both in prosperity and in adversity always held and defended with energy which it will be proved by the grace of Almighty God, has never erred from the path of apostolic tradition. So he's saying this church, and he's going to tell you which church here in a moment, which is sneak peek is going to be wrong. He's saying this church has never departed from the apostolic faith. When was this written? This was written after Pope Honorius, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And it's even more interesting because the council fathers accept this as true, which is even more interesting because he's about to tell you even his predecessors, which includes Pope Honorius, were undefiled and always held to the faith, which the council accepted. The same council who later on, a few sessions later, condemns Honorius is the same council fathers who accepted that all of the predecessors of Pope Agatha, including Honorius, were unblemished in the faith. Interesting, right? Well, there's a way that Catholics can actually understand that that makes sense, but I have no idea how an Orthodox can make sense of this, especially with what we're about to see. All right. Has both in prosperity in adversity, always held and defended with energy which it will be proved by the grace of Almighty God, has never erred from the path of the apostolic tradition, nor has she de uh, been depraved by yielding to heretical innovations, which all of the other sees did, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, Constantinople. They all fell to heresy at one point or another. But from the beginning, she has received the Christian faith from her founders, the princes of the apostles of Christ and remains undefiled unto the end. Listen to that. Listen to that. Remains undefiled unto the end. And he's about to locate this in Rome. So he's saying, Rome has always preserved the faith up until now, and always will preserve the faith unto the end. Do you believe that as an Orthodox? No, you don't. You believe that Rome went into heresy. So... You don't believe your own counsel. And remains undefiled unto the end. Why? Because it's some great city of part of the Roman Empire? Because there's a lot of martyrs there? Because Peter and Paul are awesome people who are martyred there? Those are great. But that's not the reason why he says that it remains undefiled unto the end. According to the divine promise of the Lord and Savior himself. That's interesting. So he's saying the reason why Rome is undefiled and to the end is because Christ established it as so. Now, if Christ promised it, you can't come back later and say Rome is in heresy for its papacy teachings and filioque teachings. You can't say that according to your own counsel because Christ himself promised that it would be undefiled unto the end according to your own sources, according to your own counsels and your own counsel fathers. 
which he uttered in the Gospels to the prince of his disciples, saying, Peter, Peter, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. So he's appealing to Luke 22 for the papacy and papal indefectibility. And by the way, indefectibility here is in the context of teachings on faith and morals. So the indefectibility, contra, notwithstanding Gavin Ortland's, uh, Gavin Ortland's arguments, the indefectibility here is in reference to faith and moral teachings. Because again, what is all of this letter about? About preserving the faith and the proper teachings in relation to Christ's two wills. And he's saying Rome is the one who has preserved the true teaching here because of this indefectibility, because of this promise to not lose the faith. That's called what? That's called papal infallibility. So Gavin Ortland trying to reinterpret this to mean something else and a different kind of indefectibility misses the entire context, which is about teachings of faith and morals, which is also known as, again, papal infallibility. Let's move forward, though. Let your tranquil clemency, therefore, consider, since it is the Lord and Savior of all whose faith it is, that promised that Peter's faith should not fail, Peter's faith, and exhorted him to strengthen his brothers. How is uh, how it is known that all the apostolic pontiffs, that's going to be the bishops of Rome. So he's now explicitly talking about Rome. All of the apostolic pontiffs, the predecessors of my littleness, which includes Pope Honorius, have always confidently done this very thing. Wait, 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 wait. He's saying all of the Roman pontiffs until this time have preserved the faith that includes Pope Honorius. The council accepted that. And he's saying it's because of the promise that was made to Peter. So Rome, as the successor of St. Peter, has preserved this. And you can't say, well, every bishop is a successor of Peter. In a sense, not in this sense, though. You want to say every bishop is a, is a successor of St. Peter in the sense that none of them will err in the faith? you really believe that? So no bishop has ever taught heresy. Obviously, that is not a good argument. He's talking about the unique way in which Rome is the successor of St. Peter, the bishop of Rome. Rome has been given this promise from Christ to preserve the faith. And he says, all of my predecessors has done that, which includes Honorius. And he says, it will be undefiled unto the end. So you can't say that, well, okay, somehow up until his time, none of the popes taught heresy. And, and that also would then include Honorius. Um, but okay, we'll grant that up until that time, up until Agatha, all of the popes were orthodox, but later on they go off the rail with the filioque and the papacy, which doesn't make sense historically, but whatever. That doesn't make sense in the context because he says it's a promise of Christ that these successors won't fail. So now Christ has failed in his promise if the Roman pontiffs teach heresy. And then number two, he also says it will be undefiled unto the end. Do you believe that as an Orthodox? Just admit and say, no, I don't believe that. Or say, I'm going to embrace the councils that I'm supposed to uphold, and I'm going to conform and join union with Rome. If you want to be truly Orthodox, the fullness of Orthodoxy, you have to be in communion with Rome. Otherwise, you're lacking something from Orthodoxy. That's why when I went from Orthodoxy uh, and returned to communion with Rome, I didn't feel I lost anything. I'm still Orthodox. I'm just Orthodox in communion with Rome, but Orthodox properly understood, not those who are in descent from the filioque or those who are in descent from the papacy, but Orthodoxy truly, that is preserving the faith that has been deposited to us um, in the apostles in the first century. It goes on. How it is known that all the apostolic pontiffs, the predecessors of my littleness, have always confidently done this very thing, of whom also our littleness, since I have received this ministry by divine designation, wishes to be the follower, although unequal to them, and the least of all. For woe is me if I ne neglect to preach the truth of my Lord, which they have sincerely preached, and so on. So the point is this. The council fathers accept this. And you can't say, well, they accepted only parts of it because, no, they accepted the whole thing and literally appealed to his divine 
uh, his Petrine Foundation. They accept the whole thing as divinely inspired and praised it. They don't write back and say, well, we agree with some of this, but not part, you know, this other part. No, we don't agree with. And if you're going to argue, well, maybe they're just being diplomatic and didn't say that. So they're being dishonest is what you're trying to argue. They knew that the Pope was teaching the heresy of papal infallibility. They didn't agree to it, but they failed to rebuke him and they accepted his words in an ecumenical council. They accepted a papal heresy. Is that really your argument? It doesn't work. That's why Schmemann, an Orthodox theologian um, and historian, can look at the councils and say, yeah, it really does look like they accepted the papal claims. And this is not the only instance. You have several other instances with ecumenical councils. For a Catholic, I can square this with what they do later on with Honorius. I can square it. For an Orthodox, I don't know how you can accept them. You have to accept one or the other. Well, I'll put a, a link in the show notes where you can go and see maybe uh, some of my discussions on the noise where I do that. But that's my rejoinder to um, Abbot Trifon. He says, leave Rome, come home. I say no. I say, listen to your own counsels about Rome and be reconciled to Rome. And I say that with all due respect for any Orthodox who are watching. I'm not asking you to abandon your own faith. I'm telling you to be faithful to it. Otherwise, you're actually not fully embracing Orthodoxy if you're still separated from Rome. Come to Rome where you can actually be fully Orthodox. Don't try to exist as Orthodox, separated from something essential that Christ clearly gave to us. According to your own counsels, Christ gave us this promise that Rome would not fail. Christ, according to your own counsels, gave you that. Listen to your counsels or be honest and say, I don't accept my counsel. Just be honest. At, at that point, it makes more sense why somebody would say, well, Either Rome or Oriental Orthodoxy, but even Oriental Orthodox have a problem with the Council of Ephesus and its claims about the papacy, so they kind of have the same problem. But it's even worse for the Eastern Orthodox because they accept the Sixth Ecumenical Council that's clearly much more explicit. Anyways, hope you all enjoyed this. If so, let me know what you thought about the review. Put it in the comment section. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. If you want to see more content like this, also put that in the comment. Let me know. And uh, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to get access to extra exclusive content and support what i'm doing we'll see you later god bless hey everybody just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook church chaos biblical insights for confused catholics if you are a confused catholic and you're thinking about leaving the catholic church or you're thinking about converting to the church but you see that there's a crisis in the church and you're just unsure this is the book for you again it is free just simply go to reason and theology Theology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. Reasonandtheology.com. Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.